A week is a long time in politics, they say. And it's also a surprisingly long period between sermons, I find. I wonder how many of you remember what I said last week. Even I had to go to my blog just to look it up. So uh, for those of you whose memories are as short as mine, let me just remind you of the main points. Last week, I asked you to think about the promised return of Jesus. I suggested to you that rather than him returning on some future date on a cloud with lots of trumpets and angels, that in fact Jesus has already returned, that he is returning all the time, and that he will continue to return in the future. I suggested to you that much of the end times narrative of the Bible is in fact metaphorical. And that what the Bible is really saying is be prepared. You might recall this picture yeah, of me as a little boy scout many, many years ago. Yeah? <laughs> Incidentally, if you're interested in um, thinking about end times metaphors, there was an extremely interesting interview on this morning's Sunday programme on Radio 4. I, I recommend you catch the last ten minutes of the programme, if you know how to, with all these electronic thingamajiggies, yeah? But it, it was a, a very, very interesting article. Be prepared, was the message of last week. That is, at all times and in all places, to join in with Jesus' activity in the world, here and now. I, I had a wonderful example of such preparedness this week. I'm currently supporting a Christian family in Pakistan who have reached out to us to, at certain faiths through the internet. And incidentally, I have their permission to show you this image this morning. They are moving to Havant from Pakistan next month to take up work in the care sector because God knows we need more care workers in the UK, don't we? There are lots of political issues that their decision raises, for example, about the funding of our health service and the very important matter of the UK stripping other nations of their health care workers and all, all of those kinds of issues, but, but those are for another day. The reality for this particular family who ask for your prayers and, and, and are very much looking forward to worshipping with us when they arrive the issue for them right now, the reality for them right now, is that they need help to acquire some accommodation and all the furnishings that they're going to need to set up home. They're going to arrive with just the clothes in their suitcases. So I've been praying for guidance as to how to help them. And yesterday, I wandered into church to, to check the heating system was working properly, uh, and... <laughs> And I, jumped, I bumped into someone who shall remain nameless for now, who is in the process of clearing out the house of her recently deceased mother. The kind woman asked me whether I knew anyone who could make use of some of her mother's things, such as bedding and kitchen equipment and the like. So I told her about the family from Pakistan and how they were due to arrive in Havant in a month's time, and that they'd only have the clothes in their suitcase, that kind woman then said that she would start sorting out things for the family, that they'll be able to use in their new home whenever we find one for them, like kitchen equipment and bedding and towels and so forth. What a brilliant example of being prepared to respond in situations where Jesus is working, yeah? Kindness and generosity on the part of that woman in the face of the worry and anxiety of this family. It's a brilliant example of God at work in everyday lives, your lives and mine. I feel really privileged to be standing at the nexus of that relationship as it develops. I'm honoured to have been prepared to take the leap of faith to support people that I've never met. A week is a long time in the Church of England, too. Especially, I suggest, for members of the General Synod who met this week in London. 
Now, I doubt that you've heard very much about this unless you follow the church times and, and various church websites because, of course, other events in the world have been of rather more importance to the national broadcasters than the wranglings of the Synod. But this week, the Synod primarily grappled with the vexed question of issues around the marriage or blessing of same-sex couples. A compromise has been reached by one vote, which is the nature of many compromises, isn't it? You can read all about it in your own time. I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of that. But that compromise has left both sides in the debate unsatisfied. Neither quite got what they had hoped for. But I'd like to make just a couple of observations, which I hope will be more generally informative than delving into the detail of this week's decision. The first relates to this morning's gospel reading. You'll know, of course, that the talent was a coin at the time of Jesus. Today's gospel is therefore on one level about how we invest our money in the work of God. But by serendipity, the fact that coins are also called talents means that we have the opportunity to think about the talents, abilities and innate human qualities that every Christian brings to the task of building the kingdom. When we think about the talents, we are being prepared to join in with the action of Jesus, to bring our talents and to bring the person we are, the person that God has made us to be, to that task of helping to build the kingdom. Whether we're English or Pakistani, for example, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're differently abled or typically healthy, and for the purposes of discussion about same-sex marriage, whether we're straight, gay, or any of the spectrum of genders and preferences in between, we come as we are. We come as God made us and how life has shaped us. We look forward to his transforming of who we are into something much more like the person of Jesus himself, that process of deification that I've spoken about recently. But we come with ourselves. We come with the talents we've been given by the master to the task of building God's kingdom. Jesus receives us as we are. And he welcomes all to his table. And secondly, and finally, to those who want to hold on tenaciously, and I have to say, having observed some of the debates this week, somewhat aggressively at times, to the Bible's traditional views of marriage, even to the point of being prepared, some to drive a split, a schism in the Church of England over this issue, I want to say this. Please be very careful about the weight of authority that you assign to those ancient scriptures we call the Bible. As I've said before from this pulpit, and though it's still shocking to many people when I say it, I consider that the Bible is not the Word of God. Rather, it is a collection of writings from a wide variety of authors, inspired by God, written across a number of centuries, which all point towards the true Word of God, who is the Logos himself, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, in the words of the letter to the Hebrews, is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the light of wisdom in the darkness of human ignorance. If we think that Jesus has stopped speaking to the church, 
helping us to move forward, then we've misunderstood the whole purpose of Jesus coming and teaching us and shaping our beliefs and then promising the Holy Spirit to lead us continually into all truth. What did Jesus say on the topic of homosexuality? This slide has a a blank space under the question quite deliberately. He said, not one word. Not one word. But he did speak repeatedly of the kingdom principles of love, of faithfulness, of preparedness to move where the Spirit is leading. He didn't want us to be shackled to the ancient scriptures, but rather he wanted us to be shackled to him, to the God who fulfills the scriptures. What does it mean to fulfill the scriptures? Well, I think it means that all scriptures need to be held up to the light of Jesus. So if Jesus said to act in this way, even when such act appears to contradict something in scripture, then what do we do? We follow Jesus's lead, don't we? Uh, An example, an obvious example, is the teaching on, on revenge. Jesus reminded people that the Hebrew Bible teaches an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus quotes that scripture and then says, but I say to you, forgive your brother constantly. 70 times seven. So in conclusion, to anyone who would invite me to place religious dogma over Jesus' clear instruction that we should love one another and serve one another, I say, no, I'm not going to do that. To anyone who would invite me to join in a schism in the Church of England over a single issue of whether two faithful, loving people can be blessed by a church that is quite happy to bless battleships, but will not bless the union of two loving people, then I say this, I'm prepared, I'm equipped with the talents that he has given me, I'm following Jesus, and I will bless such faithful and committed love. And I hope that you would say the same too. Amen. That was kind, thank you, because it wasn't an easy sermon to preach. What I will say is that if anything I've said this morning you want to unpack with me, I'll be here after church. I'll I'll sit myself over here with a cup of coffee. And if you'd like to challenge me, discuss further anything I've said, come and join me.